It is my observation that many of those who call themselves truth seekers, Gnostics or any other designation that describes the search for the understanding of that discomfort that from somewhere deep down tells us that something is not right with existence in this reality, are, are actually looking for a harbor that warmly accepts that they anchor there, their current infested ships, instead of realizing that before the world it is they who need to be cleansed, washed, or, if that's your preferred cup of tea, baptized in the pure waters of truth. Truth never comes from the world. Never. The world will always try to sell you, or better said, tempt you, whatever it can to keep you addicted to your worldly self. It is through the worldly self, as a parasitic attachment, that the world that we see as evidently evil is maintained. It is maintained by our pride, our envy, our wrath, our sloth, our greed, our gluttony, our lust. <laughs> yes, you heard correctly. The seven deadly sins? They are temptations, not judgments. They are traps to capture us, not penalties for such faults. Why are they deadly then? Well, because we are dead like walking Frankenstein monster bodies, when we are with them and without our true selves. Because submerging in these temptations moves us away from our connection to truth, in favor of a connection to a reality that is anything but truth. Absence of truth is falsehood, and since true life can only exist in truth, the absence of truth is death. If I was to attribute initials to the words sin, it would stand for simulated interactive nature. It is simulated as in not truth. It is interactive because it demands our most invested interaction to be maintained. And it is nature because it encompasses a whole reality set, uh, a world per se. Now most of us, if not all, are motiv motivated at some point to find answers to the nagging doubts and discomforts, which are our true self's best friends, actually, in order to make the world a better place. You see, the world, in time, will become a better place, as it will, in time, become a worse one. The world wheel turns and turns to ensure that we are submerged, to entice us to think that we have a mission in it, not a mission out of it. While we emotionally and intellectually invest ourselves in improving the simulation, we feed it, we offer our code to, to it by reducing truth to a set of world-fitting platitudes and superficial and artificial concepts. The world has a set time to become better, to alleviate soul pressure, and a set time to become worse, to squeeze it again. Therefore, it is not the world that needs saving, nor anyone else in it. Only the part of each of us that is truth. And to save that part is to realize, identify and empty that which, it, that which is not truth. It is to shut off the emotional submersion that feeds this seemingly all-encompassing non-truth. It is to shut off our addictions to the senses at a primary level and to the constructs that, through the sense enforcement, filled the vacuum left when we turned away from truth. If truth is absent in us, then something false took its place. You see, on the other side, we also have those who are motivated not by making the world a better place, but by making their place in the world better. It is the same in an apparent duality. The worldly good and evil are both simulations. They are both false. They are simply emotional triggers to provide purpose and feed the submersion by offering us a meaning to invest our entire energy in. If one was to consider an absolute good, then that would have to be simply truth. Whatever it is, regardless of how much our senses addicted, emotion addicted, purpose addicted, junky personalities and characters dislike it. They loathe it because they are not only not true, they are not us. 
They are what took over the part of us that we left behind, somewhere along the way in this submersion. The junkie needs his drug, so he also needs the dealer, and the dealer lives in the mind of the junkie, talking to him as a master of his conscience. We should not beat around the bush when facing our predicament and hopelessness, such as felt in depression. These can certainly be our messengers of realization. If we can, as we feel ourselves dying or already dead, as depression so often causes, we are able to hear the inner smooth voice that only sings but never speaks a word and, through it, understand that it, it is our intricacies, not the world, that needs to change. It is we, not the world, that needs to be saved. Not saved by simply switching energy and worship parasites in the world, but by creating that vacuum again, through washing away the false from within, so the truth can, again, gradually come back to take its rightful, rightful place. The origin of the word religion is the Latin religare, which means to reconnect. Yet, false religion, even non-formal or official religion, attracts those that are seeking to be able to reconnect him to the sin or, like I identified or defined, simulated interactive nature. Because they demand belief and trust and worship and investment. If it was truth, it wouldn't need to demand anything, nor would it need to be enforced or reinforced by habituation. It would simply be experienced and be found undeniable. True religion, or reconnection, can only occur within ourselves because we are the world. No, I'm not going to sing that toxic inversion of a song that was made so popular decades ago to feed off an original sense of solidarity. We are the world because we have given in to it, offering ourselves as children for a sacrifice to what is, it is made up of, all the lies, constructs and deceits. We have to doubt it and use doubt as a deconstruction tool to create the empty room that can be refilled anew with truth. We need to change, but before that, we must face where we are and what we are in it. We need to analyze in the most honest way if the intentions that guide our search are leading us to try to be at ease with existing submerged uh, in the temptations of the world where anything goes. We need to meditate and contemplate on the triggers of the thoughts that make us, makes us quell our inner rebellion. And mind you, I am not talking about a wrathful rebellion, but a quiet, even silent one. For it speaks no words, and it demands no real action. Remember that sequence of scenes in Return of the Jedi, where Luke is in the presence of the Emperor and is fighting Darth Vader? The Emperor wanted him to kill Darth Vader, to wrathfully rebel, to give in to hatred, because that is how he wins. It doesn't matter who lives and who dies. As long as someone falls into temptation, he is fed. It was when Luke gave up fighting and submitted to enduring the open and unmasked attacks upon him of the dark parasite that made a junkie of his father, that his father was saved and threw the emperor back down to the abyss. Quite symbolical, isn't it? Why is such a true scene, as many others, promoted by the world? Well, I personally find two reasons. The first is that it wants us to not to seek any further. The movie is there, so watch and you are done. No need to, to look deeper. And existence can continue as before. Just watch it again when you need to feel better again, such as praying to something that dwells outside and seemingly far away. The other reason is that perhaps even the world itself and its emperor want to be found and killed, and the Darth Vader that goes around the world as his regent wants to be defeated and saved by the recognition of his true son. 
something to contemplate. Whichever the case may be, the first step is to understand why we are doing what we do, what are the actual reasons that make us move, act, and most importantly, think and feel. Truth speaks no words. It simply is overwhelmingly undeniable and simple.